Okay, so strap in everybody because this deep dive, well, this one's going to be a wild ride. Mm. We're diving headfirst into some seriously creepy stuff today. You guys have sent in some seriously spine tingling stories about this place called Hollow Oak Manor. And let me tell you, from what I'm seeing, this is not your run-of-the-mill haunted house. This place, it's got history, a heavy, unsettling history, and I don't know, maybe even a life of its own, you know? So let's see what we can uncover about Hollow Oak Manor, shall we? Intriguing choice for a deep dive, it really is. You know, it's amazing how these massive old houses, they often become like these focal points for our deepest fears, those anxieties we have about the unknown, all the details we've got to work with here, the location, the architecture, the stories of whispers and shadows, they all tap into something, something primal, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. It's like they're practically begging to have scary stories told about them. First off, we've got Hollow Oak Manor itself. Just picture this. Victorian-era mansion, dark gables, overgrown ivy, the whole nine yards. And get this, it's perched right on the edge of a thick, dark forest near a town, are you ready for this, called Raven's Peak. I mean, come on, Raven's Peak. That name alone is enough to give me goosebumps. It's like something out of a go gothic novel, isn't it? And you've hit on a key element here, isolation. It's like being cut off from everything familiar, you know? Like it makes your mind more vulnerable to those what-if thoughts, you know? Mm -hmm. And when a place already has a reputation for strange happenings, Let's just say those whispers can easily take root in your imagination and grow into something much, much bigger. And Hollow Oak doesn't just have whispers. It's got full-blown stories, legends. We're talking ghostly encounters, local legends, and the most unsettling detail of them all, unexplained disappearances. And not just, like, way back when. We're talking recent times. Even now, you'd think people would just stay away. That's the strange thing, isn't it? The very things that should make us run in the opposite direction, they often draw us in closer. It's like a moth to a flame, that irresistible pull of the unknown. Why are we so fascinated by these places, these stories, even when they're filled with fear and dread? I know, right? It's like this weird magnetic pull. You've got this big, imposing manner, shrouded in mystery, steeped in this creepy history. And still, people are drawn to it, like compelled to be near it. Which reminds me, you mentioned some stories about the manor's more recent occupants, uh, a young couple, right? Yes, a young couple, Emily and Mark. They moved into Hollow Oak looking for, well, a fresh start, a change of pace. City dwellers, from what I understand, they were longing for a quieter life. They came across this beautiful old manor, saw the price, and it seemed almost too good to be true. And, well, they took the plunge. They bought it. There's always a catch, isn't there? With these places, there's always a catch. So what happened next? Did they find that piece they were looking for? For a while, it seemed like they did, you know? They were totally charmed by the place. I mean, Hollow Oak, it's easy to see how it could seduce you with its looks, you know? All those anxieties they might have had, they were kind of pushed aside, overshadowed by the sheer beauty of the place. Emily and Mark, they dismissed all the local stories as, well, just that, stories, folklore. You know how it is, stuff made up to entertain tourists. But like, come on, it's like they say over here. Yeah. Where there's smoke. There's fire. And Hollow Oak seemed to have a whole bonfire's worth of creepy stories attached to it. So when did things start to, you know, take a turn for the worse? What were the first signs that something was off, that maybe those local legends weren't so far-fetched after all? It started subtly. A whisper here, a creak there. Classic haunted house stuff. Mark mentioned hearing footsteps when he was home alone, which, okay, I mean, big house, old house, it's probably just the house settling, right? But still, even the most skeptical mind in a place like Hollow Oak, well, let's just say you can't help but feel a little uneasy. But then things escalated. Uh-oh. Escalated how? Give me the details. I can handle it. All the clocks in the house, every single one, yeah. stopped working. And they all stopped at the exact same time, 3.33 a.m. Imagine that. Waking up in the middle of the night and it's completely silent. No ticking clocks. Just stillness. Okay, yeah, that's not just creepy, that's straight up unnerving. Clock stopping, especially at a specific time like that, it's like, I don't know, a crack in reality or something. So did Emily and Mark try to, like, get out of there, call for help or something? They did, or at least they tried to. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you? They decided to cut their losses, pack their bags, and get the heck out of Dodge. But it seems Hollow Oak wasn't about to let them go that easily. Every time they tried to leave, something would happen. Flat tires, dead car batteries, sudden storms, you name it. It was like the house was holding them hostage. That's what's so freaky about these stories. It's like the house itself is alive, aware, and it doesn't want them to leave. So what did they do? I mean, they're trapped in this house. Things are getting weirder by the minute. What's their next move? Well, Emily was, well, she was pretty much freaked out, understandably so. Mark, 
he decided to do a little digging, some research into the history of the house. He was trying to find some kind of explanation for what was going on, you know, maybe some logical reason behind the weirdness. And that's when things got really interesting. Okay, I'm on the edge of my seat here. Tell me about this research. What did he find out about Hollow Oak and the people who lived there before? Through old journals, town records, and some pretty creepy accounts from local historians, Mark uncovered the story of the Ravenscroft family, the original owners of the manor. Let's just say they were an interesting bunch. Interesting is one word for it. What were they into? Well, let's just say they were rumored to be really into the occult. Dark rituals, secret ceremonies, that kind of thing. Whispers of some seriously creepy stuff. They disappeared without a trace back in 1903. No heirs, no bodies ever found, nothing. No bodies. Okay, now that's just creepy. It's like they just vanished into thin air. So did Mark find any connection between the Ravenscrofts and the weird stuff happening to him and Emily? It's like I said, that's when things got even weirder. Mark, he started experiencing these episodes of missing time. Like hours would go by and he would have no memory of what happened. Missing time, huh? That's never a good sign. Did he remember anything at all from these episodes or was it just a complete blank? Every time he'd find himself drawn back to the manor's grandfather clock, you know, the one that was frozen at 3, 3, 3 a.m., yeah. like he was being pulled there against his will. Okay, now that's just wrong. Like, what is it about that clock? It's like the horror of all the creepiness or something. So we've got Mark being drawn to a haunted grandfather clock and experiencing missing time. What about Emily? Was she having her own unsettling encounters with Hollow Oak? Oh, she was definitely not immune to it. While Mark was busy with his research and his disappearing acts, Emily, she found herself drawn to another part of the house, the attic. And that, my friend, is where things took a very dark turn. An attic. Of course, it's the attic. It's like the Bermuda Triangle of creepy old houses. What was waiting for her up there? An attic, huh? Okay, so what was it about this particular attic that was so creepy? Was it like full of creepy dolls and old Ouija boards or what? It wasn't so much what was in the attic, but what Emily found there, hidden away in a corner, practically covered in dust and cobwebs, was this old antique mirror. You know, mirrors have always been a bit creepy, right? Like that feeling of being watched, like there's something on the other side. But this mirror, this was different. Its surface was all distorted, like it was alive or something, like a window to another world, you know? Okay, now that sense chills down my spine. Did she see anything in the mirror, or was it more of like a feeling, a vibe? Emily said she saw figures in the mirror, but like... Not anyone who was actually there with her in the room. It was like they were trapped on the other side trying to get out. And here's the thing. It wasn't just that she saw them. It was like she felt this this pull towards the mirror, you know? Oh, no. That's not good. That's how these stories always get worse. So what happened? What did she do? Well, remember how Mark was experiencing those episodes of missing time? Yeah, and ending up in front of that creepy grandfather clock, like he was being drawn there. Right. So one night, Emily woke up and Mark was gone. Vanished. Oh no, this is bad. I can feel it. She searched the whole house, but there was no sign of him anywhere. And then she felt this irresistible pull towards the attic. You're kidding. Not the attic with the creepy mirror. Oh, this is bad. What happened when she got up to the attic? She found herself standing in front of the mirror. It was like her body was moving on its own. And that's when she saw him. Mark. Mark. Where was he? Don't tell me. He was in the mirror. He was trapped inside the mirror. He was pounding on the glass like he was desperate to get out, but he couldn't. This is just awful. Okay, I'm officially creeped out now. So <laughs> what happened to Emily? <laughs> She didn't. She reached out to him, her hand. It went right through his reflection, like he was made of smoke or something. And that's when it happened. This surge of energy, this pull. And then she was gone too. Oh my gosh, she got sucked into the mirror too. No way, this is insane. What happened next? Did anyone else go looking for them? The police, they investigated their disappearance. But Hollow Oak, it doesn't give up its secrets easily. The house was empty. No sign of Emily or Mark. All they found was a single set of footprints. Footprints? Whose footprints? Mark's. Leading to the attic, stopping right in front of that antique mirror. So they were both taken by the house by whatever's lurking inside that mirror. This is by far one of the creepiest deep dives we've ever done. It makes you wonder what could be so powerful, so alluring, and yet so dangerous that it can trap people like that. It's a terrifying thought, but also kind of makes you think, doesn't it? That's the thing about these stories, about places like Hollow Oak Manor. They remind us that there are still mysteries in this world things we may never fully understand. And sometimes, the scariest thought of all is that maybe, just maybe, 
there are some doors that are better left unopened. Well said. It's a chilling reminder that the unknown can be both fascinating and terrifying. Ever heard of a place that just gives you chills? A place whispered about, not talked about? Oh, I know the feeling. Places that hold on to secrets, you know? Exactly. That's what we're diving into today. Blackwater Swamp. Ooh, now that's a name that sends shivers down the spine. Yeah, just outside Castor's Hollow. Picture this. Ancient cypress trees, the kind draped in Spanish moss, sun barely peeking through. And mist, right? Gotta have that mist clinging to the water. Like something out of a dream, but a little unsettling. It's that feeling of being untouched, like stepping back in time, yeah. that gets you. And with it, the sense that something's watching from the shadows. You know what I mean? Yeah, like something older than time itself. Which brings us to the heart of it. Blackwater Swamp isn't just spooky. It's got a mystery that's hooked folks for generations. Ever heard of Will-o'-the-Wisps? Oh, sure. Flickering lights over swamps, yeah. Exactly. In Blackwater, they call them ghost lights. Imagine. For centuries, these eerie orbs of light have been spotted dancing over the water. Leading people astray, right? Classic folklore. It's like something out of a scary story. Well, there's actually a pretty simple explanation for them. Really? You're going to tell me it's just swamp gas? Well, yes and no. See, will-o'-the-wisps are often attributed to gases like methane igniting in the swamp. It's a natural process. Okay, I'll bite. <laughs> but if it's so natural, why is it always tied to spooky stories and legends? That's the fascinating part. Maybe it's just how our minds work, you know? We see something unexplainable and we give it meaning. Like our ancestors saw those lights and thought, must be ghosts. Exactly. But here's the thing about Blackwater. It's not just the lights. Local legend says that anyone who tries to follow them vanishes. Wait, seriously? Gone without a trace. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? That's more than just spooky stories. That's unsettling. Exactly. Science can explain the lights, but the disappearances, that's where the real mystery begins. And that's not even the half of it. Because Blackwater has another claim to fame, and it's even more chilling. The Legend of the Phantom. Oh, this I've got to hear. Not your average ghost story, I'm guessing. Not even close. Imagine this. A tall, gaunt figure hidden in the shadows. Ooh, I'm getting goosebumps already. But the most terrifying detail. Glowing eyes. Like something out of a nightmare. Okay, that's just creepy. You said it. And it's not like this phantom is just hanging around either. It seems like it chooses when to appear. Like it's hunting. Intriguing. When did these sightings start, do we know? Early 1900s, from what I've heard. It's right. like something was awakened back then. Almost as if the modern world encroaching on this untouched place stirred something up. Because that's when the stories took a dark turn. Hunters would venture into the swamp. Wait, don't tell me. Their horses would return to town. Alone. Saddles empty. Okay, now that sends shivers down my spine. That suggests something more deliberate, wouldn't you say? Like something was targeting them, picking them off? That's a chilling thought. And it gets even creepier. We haven't talked about Claire Davenport. Oh, I've heard whispers of her story. A chilling encounter, wasn't it? In the 1970s, she and her husband had an experience that perfectly sums up the Blackwater Swamp mystery. So tell me more about Clara's encounter. What happened? Well, like so many others drawn into the mystery, it all started with the lights. Clara and her husband Jack were out on the swamp one evening. Fishing, I bet. You got it. It was getting late, shadows getting long, when they saw them, the ghost lights flickering across the water. Oh, man. I can already feel the tension. It's like they're being lured in, you know? That's exactly what it's like hearing Clara tell it. It's that pull of the unknown, the what if. So did they, like, try to find the source of the lights? They did. Clara said the deeper they went into the swamp, the weirder it got. The air turned cold, a thick fog rolled in. It's almost like the swamp was closing in on them, you know? Okay, yeah, that's spooky. Anything else? Or is that when they, like, hightailed it out of there? That's when the whispers started. Whispers? Like, what do you mean, whispers? The wind or something? No, no, like voices. Yeah. Whispering her name, Clara's name. Get out of here. Okay, see, that's where I'd nope. Right out of there. Nope, nope, nope. Right. But Jack, he was something else. He kept saying it was the wind, playing tricks, you know. Trying to rationalize it, I guess. I mean, I've been in some creepy places where the wind can sound like voices. Exactly. But then the lights, they stopped moving. Just hovered there like eyes in the dark. Clara said she felt this, this dread like something was watching them. I don't even want to ask, but mm. what happened next? That's when she saw it. The phantom. Tall, thin, just like in the stories. No way. Right there in front of them. Standing at the edge of the mist, she said. 
long shadowy fingers, a big hat hiding its face. But those eyes, right? You said it earlier, those glowing eyes. Clara said when those eyes met hers, she knew. She was looking at something ancient, powerful, and very, very dangerous. Okay, yeah, that's the stuff of nightmares. Did it try to hurt them? She said Jack finally freaked out, yelled at her to run to get back to the boat. Smart man. But Clara, she said she couldn't move, like the swamp itself had a hold of her. Wait, are you saying the swamp was alive? Like helping the phantom or something? That's how she described it, yeah. yeah. Like it all connected, the swamp, the phantom, the whole place. It's a pretty unsettling thought, isn't it? That's more than unsettling, that's terrifying. So what happened? How did they get away? Jack somehow got to her, pulled her towards the boat. They just made it out of there as fast as they could. Wow, they were lucky to escape with their lives. But I have a feeling that wasn't the end of it, was it? I bet that messed them up pretty good, even if they got away. Oh, absolutely. That kind of encounter, it stays with you. It changes you. They may have escaped the swamp that night, but the swamp, well, the swamp never really lets go, does it? Once it's got its hooks in you, it doesn't let go. Oh. So what happened to Clara and Jack after that night? Well, Jack, he just couldn't shake it off. He told Clara that he kept hearing the lights calling to him, even in his sleep, like they wanted him back. It's like that morbid curiosity taken to the extreme, knowing something's dangerous but being drawn to it anyway. Exactly. Clara begged him to forget about the swamp, to just let it go, but... But some things you can't just forget, right? Right. A week later, he disappeared. They found his boat drifting on the water empty. Only thing left behind was his fishing hat. Oh, man. That's awful. Do you think he went back willingly, or, or did the swamp take him? Clara always believed he was lured back. Like something in the swamp was calling his name, drawing him in. Just like those whispers that called to Clara on the water. You know, it makes you wonder, what if the swamp, what if it chooses who it takes? That's the question, isn't it? Is it random? Or is there some reason, some pattern to it? Like maybe it sensed something in Jack, some vulnerability. It's a chilling thought, isn't it? That something out there could be so in tune with us, so aware of our deepest fears and desires. Okay, so we've got these eerie lights, people vanishing, and this phantom lurking in the shadows. What's the answer? What's really going on in Blackwater Swamp? If only we knew. That's the thing about a good mystery, isn't it? It keeps you guessing. So no answers, just more questions. Some mysteries are bigger than us, I think. Bigger than any explanation. Blackwater Swamp, it's like it exists somewhere between reality and myth. A place where the natural world and the supernatural, they kind of bleed together. We may never know the whole truth about Blackwater Swamp, but one thing's for sure. It's a place that stays with you long after you've left it behind. A place that makes you question what's out there, lurking in the shadows. And sometimes, maybe it's better not to know. Ever find yourself holding your breath in a silent room? Not because you're afraid, exactly, but because yeah. the quiet itself, it feels like it's listening. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's the kind of unsettling territory we're exploring today um, with the story of Eldridge Asylum. Eldridge Asylum. And what's really intriguing here is how this story, this is from the fictional podcast, Whispers in the Dark. Right. Yeah. They use silence, but not just as like a setting, but as a weapon. Right. We're not talking about your like typical haunted house creaks and groans and chains rattling. Right. This is I mean, about the unnerving power of what you don't hear. Exactly. Imagine this. Eldridge Asylum. Perched on a desolate hillside built in the late 1800s, a place already steeped in rumors of mistreatment, unexplained disappearances. And not just patients vanishing. Brett, we're talking staff, too. Oh, yeah. Like the asylum itself was <laughs> hungry. Right. Yeah, it's almost like whatever haunted elders didn't like distinguish between like who it took, which makes it even more terrifying, I think. Precisely. And that unsettling feeling, it only intensifies in 1953. With the arrival of a patient named Sarah Whitman. Okay. The staff called her the Watcher. Okay, I'm getting chills already. What was so strange about her? It wasn't what she did, yeah. but what she didn't do, Sarah was completely silent. Oh, wow. No speaking, no writing, no response to any attempts at communication, just watching. So we've got this already eerie asylum, a history of people vanishing without a trace, and then this, like, silent, watchful patient Talk about an unsettling combination, and then things get even more intense, am I right? Yes. Just picture this. A massive storm rolls in. Oh, no. Cuts off the power to Eldridge. The asylum is plunged into darkness. 
And that's when the screaming begins. The silent scream. The silent scream. Yeah, I've heard so much about this. But to fully grasp the terror of it, we need to clarify what the scream actually is. It okay. wasn't a sound anyone could pinpoint. More like this, omnipresent wave of terror. So it wasn't a scream you could hear with your ears. Yeah. More like a feeling. Exactly. The source material describes it as this... Um, dreadful presence, this mm -hmm. wave of pure terror that seemed to be everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Huh. The Whispers in the Dark podcast really knows how to build suspense, I have to give them that. But a scream that's not actually a sound, that's a whole other level of creepy. And it gets worse. Those who experienced the silent scream, even briefly, were left. Ch changed. Changed. How? What happened? They lost their voices. Completely. Imagine the terror, the vulnerability of being unable to call for help, to even scream in the face of such an unknown entity. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's horrifying. Okay. So this silence is not just like a backdrop to the story. It's actively being inflicted. Precisely. And the source material doesn't shy away from the psychological impact of this at all. Imagine the heavy silence that must have, like permeated Eldridge after the silent scream. A silence born not from peace, but from fear and loss. So what happened after the storm? Did anyone, like figure out what caused this silent scream or what happened to the people who vanished. That's the thing about Eldritch, right? The unknowns are almost as unsettling as the events themselves. When the power returned, some of the staff who had heard the scream were just gone. Just like that. Vanished. Yes. And the asylum itself shut down soon after. Officially, it was due to budget reasons. Right. But locals, they knew better. Eldridge and the silent scream had become inseparable. The very name whispered with fear and dread. Yeah, it's like something out of a nightmare, you know, an urban legend come to life. You said it happened in 1953, right? Was that the end of it? Not quite. Fast forward to 2008. Enter Thomas Langley, a paranormal investigator who very publicly prided himself on his skepticism. Okay, so we've gone from a silent, watchful patient to a silent, screaming asylum to a skeptic walking right into the heart of it all. This Langley guy, he sounds almost as interesting as the asylum itself. What was he hoping to prove? Langley believed that with enough technology and a rational mind, any so-called haunting could be debunked. He saw Eldridge as the perfect opportunity to prove his theories and expose the myths surrounding the silent scream. So this skeptic, Langley, walks into Eldridge. This place practically synonymous with, you know, eerie silence and a scream that no one can really explain. Yeah. What happened? Did he find his proof or did Eldridge uh, proven wrong? Well, that's where whispers in the dark really hooks you. Langley, he arrived at Eldridge armed with like all the latest technology yeah. and a team of equally skeptical investigators. They were ready for, I think, anything or so they thought. I'm guessing things didn't go quite as planned. Not exactly. Almost immediately, they started experiencing all these strange occurrences. We're talking temperature drops, EVP recordings with like unsettling whispers. Right, the classics. Oh, yeah, classic haunting tropes. But I think experienced firsthand, they began to like chip away at Langley's certainty. Okay, so the asylum starts to work its unsettling magic on them. Uh. Then what? Is that when they encounter the silent scream? You're way ahead of me. The um the tension builds as the team delves deeper into Eldridge. And yes, eventually they do encounter the okay. silent scream. Well, what happens? Does Langley explain it away? That's the thing about Eldridge. It doesn't offer easy answers. The source material describes the team becoming scattered, disoriented during the encounter. Equipment malfunctions. One of his team members, Gina Quetch, she experiences a terrifying premonition and then she loses her voice, just like those people back in 53. They manage to escape, but not unscathed. Two of their cameras vanish. And Gina, well, she's never the same after that night. Wow. So even with, like, all his skepticism and technology, Langley couldn't escape that uh, eerie hold Eldridge has. It makes you wonder, like, if even a skeptic like Langley could be shaken to his core, what chance do the rest of us have? Yeah, it speaks to, like, a, a certain primal fear I think we all share. Right. That some things, some places just can't be explained away, you yeah. know? That the rational mind, sometimes it just has no defense against the truly uncanny. Which brings us back to Langley's conclusion after his experience in Eldridge, right? He's, like, convinced the silent scream, it isn't just a haunting, but some kind of, I don't know, malevolent entity feeding on the fear of those who dare to enter. You know, this reflects a really common theme in horror. The skeptic who becomes like a believer. Right. It taps into our fear of the unknown becoming undeniable. The idea that our rational minds can be, you know, 
overwhelmed by experience. Yeah. It's like, how do you rationalize an experience that defies all rational explanation? And and even more so, like, how do you walk away unchanged? And if we connect this back to, you know, whispers in the dark, it directly links to the idea of Eldred's being cursed. Oh, right. A place where something went profoundly wrong, yeah. leaving a mark, an echo of something sinister that lingers. Which uh, circles back to our discussion of silence. The very thing that should represent, you know, peace, nothingness, right. becomes like a source of dread and terror within Eldridge's walls. It's the silence isn't empty, but rather like full of these unspoken horrors. Which brings us back to Sarah Whitman, the um, silent patient. Whispers in the dark really leaves us with this chilling question. Was she a victim of Eldridge? Or a conduit for its darkness? Or, you know, something else entirely, a force that perhaps existed before the asylum and will remain long after? It's like the silence itself is a question, whispering unanswered. Yes. This entire uh, deep dive has been a chilling reminder that sometimes the things we don't hear, they can be far more frightening than the things we do. Yeah. Talking cold, hollow woods and that legend of the forgotten cabin. Ah, uh, yes. I've heard whispers. Right. Missing people, strange events. It's like that place just, well, it unsettles people. You know, it's fascinating, though, isn't it? How a place can hold such power. It's not just about the physical location. It's the stories, the legends yeah. that really get under our skin. Totally. It's like our minds can't resist a good mystery, you know. And this deep dive, it, uh, well, it explores that human element, that obsession with the unknown. Exactly. It's yeah. not just about a haunted cabin in the woods, is it? It's about what draws us to those places, what makes us want to believe, even when logic tells us otherwise. Okay, so picture this. Late 1800s, you got this prospector, Elias Harker. A prospector, huh? Practical down to earth. Exactly. You'd think he'd be all about the gold, right? No time for spooky stories. Well, the podcast uses his journal entries, so you feel like you're right there with him. Ah, oh, that's a nice touch brings you into the story. And what he describes, it's, well, it's more than just finding a creepy cabin. Oh, He's wow. drawn to it. Like he feels this pull, this dot presence. Ooh. Okay. Now that's giving me chills. It's like sometimes those subtle details, that feeling of being watched, that's scarier than any monster, you know? Tell me about it. I... And then he finds it, the cabin, and there's this chair, just one wooden chair right in the middle of the room. Ooh. It's amazing how something so ordinary can become so unsettling, right? Mm. Like, it makes you wonder who put it there, why, what was it used for? And who or what might be waiting for someone to sit in it next, right? I mean, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. It's like it's meant for you, that chair. Like yeah. an invitation you can't refuse. It's giving me major Goldilocks vibes, except, you know, way creepier. Definitely not a fairy tale, this one. No, not at all. So Elias, he hightails it out of there, right? Right. But then he hears footsteps. Following him all the way to the edge of the woods. They stop there. Like, whatever it was, it couldn't or wouldn't follow him back to town. See, you know, that's what gets me, that psychological torment. Was it real or was it the fear playing tricks on him? Right. The podcast plays with that, that blurring of what's real, what's in your head. Because sometimes the scariest monsters are the ones we create ourselves, right? Mm, huh, isn't that the truth? Okay, so we've got this creepy cabin, a mysterious chair, and a whole lot of unanswered questions. But the story doesn't end there. There's more. Oh yeah, we're just getting started. Fast forward to the 1970s, we've got Rachel and Mark, a young couple who, well, they decide to tempt fate. You know, they've heard the stories about Cold Hollow Woods, but... But they don't believe them. Right. Or maybe they're drawn to that danger. Maybe a little of both. What's interesting about them is they're experienced hikers. They knew the woods. Ah, so it wasn't just a case of being unprepared city folk wandering into the unknown. Nope. And that's what makes their story even creepier. They go into cold, hollow woods, and only Rachel comes out. Okay, now that's just tragic. And it makes you wonder, what happened to Mark? We only have Rachel's account, and honestly, it's chilling. She talks about this almost irresistible urge to sit in the chair, the same chair Elias wrote about all those years ago. Ooh, that's interesting. It's like... Maybe there is something to this chair, something that calls to people. Almost like it has a hold on them. Exactly. Like it has its own kind of power or energy. And here's where it gets really strange. After she sits in the chair, Rachel says the woods dot changed. They shifted around her. Like she stepped into another reality. You know, that's something you often hear about in folklore, these liminal spaces where the veil between worlds is thin. Liminal spaces? Yeah, like, you know how doorways are often seen as thresholds? 
places of transition. Well, some places like forests, crossroads, even graveyards, they can have that liminal quality too. They're places where the boundaries between our world and, well, other realms might be weaker. So you're saying cold hollow woods could be one of these liminal spaces. It's a possibility, isn't it? Okay, now my mind is officially blown. But getting back to Rachel, she escapes the woods, but Mark, he's gone. Vanished without a trace. And it's like Rachel's, well, she's never the same. Like that place, it took something from her. It's interesting, though, how these stories, even if fictional, tap into something deeper, don't they? That primal fear of the unknown, of getting lost, of being watched. It's like they're tapping into something ancient in our collective unconscious. It's like our deepest fears made real. Exactly. And maybe, just maybe, by exploring those fears through stories like this, we can learn to face them, to understand them a little better. All right, so that's one creepy cabin, a missing fiancé, and a whole lot of unsettling questions. But we're just scratching the surface here. We'll be right back after a quick break to delve even deeper into the mysteries of cold, hollow woods. Don't go anywhere. So it's like you go into these woods, right? One of you comes back, forever changed, the other, dot gone. For the podcast, it doesn't just leave us hanging with the mystery. It goes deeper, looking for reasons, explanations. Right. And that's what makes this so compelling. It's not just, ooh, spooky story. It's exploring those darker possibilities, both the supernatural and the psychological. Like how much of what we experience is, you know, actually real versus what our minds create, especially when we're scared, isolated, like those survival stories you hear. Lost in the wilderness, people start seeing things, hearing things. Absolutely. Our senses can play tricks on us, especially in extreme situations. Think about it. Lack of sleep, maybe dehydration, the constant fear. It can really mess with your perception of reality. And the podcast, it gets into that, how being out in the elements, sleep deprived, even some types of like fungi that grow in forests, yep. they can cause hallucinations, paranoia. Right, like totally natural explanations for what might seem supernatural. But then it takes this turn and dives into dimensional rifts. Ooh, okay, hold on. Now we're getting into some really interesting territory. Right, this idea that there are places where like reality glitches, like maybe those stories about other dimensions, they're not so far-fetched. It's that liminal space concept again, but taken to a whole new level. Those in-between places where the veil between worlds is thin, where anything is possible. And suddenly, Rachel's experience, the woods shifting around her, it takes on a whole new meaning, right? It goes from, oh, that's creepy, to, hold on, is our reality even what we think it is? It's like the podcast is making us question everything we thought we knew about the world. And what's cool is that it offers some practical advice, too. You know how you love a good takeaway. Oh, absolutely. Give me something I can use. Right. So the podcast, amidst all the chills and theories, it emphasizes the importance of having a base camp if you're venturing into unfamiliar territory. Which, in a place like Cold Hollow Woods, takes on a whole new meaning, right? Wow. It's not just about having a place to sleep. It's about having a fixed point in reality that might be dot fluid. Whoa, yeah. A grounding point, literally. Like, keep your feet on the ground because everything else might be shifting around you. It's that grounding, that reminder, that even when faced with the unknown, we still have to rely on our wits, our preparation. It's empowering in a way, isn't it? It is, because it's saying, hey, the world might be a scary, mysterious place, but we don't have to face it unprepared. We have agency, even in the face of the unknown. Right. We can be scared and still take precautions. I love that. Me too. It's that balance of acknowledging the mystery while also empowering ourselves with knowledge and you know, a healthy dose of skepticism. It's like they're saying, yeah, be curious, but don't check your brain at the door, right? Exactly. Wrong. Use your head, but also embrace the mystery. Hmm. And that brings us to this, well, this final thought that the podcast leaves us with. Oh, yeah. Hit me with it. So, okay, real or not, this forgotten cabin, these stories, mm -hmm. they tap into something, you know, primal, deep down in all of us. Those fears, right? The dark being watched. It's like no matter how, like, civilized we get, that stuff's still there. Exactly. We can't escape it. It's part of what makes us human. So what? We're drawn to these stories because of that? Like a safe way to freak ourselves out. Maybe. A controlled dose of fear. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of running from it, we lean in. But on our terms. Okay, yeah. I can see that. Like reading a scary story before bed versus actually being stalked in the woods. Exactly. And the podcast, it, it poses this question. And honestly, it's one I've been wrestling with. Okay, yeah, on me. Knowing everything... The stories, the risks, the weirdness. Yeah. Would you, would you go to Cold Hollow Woods? 
Ooh, good question. It's one thing to, you know, analyze it all from a distance, but to actually go there, I don't know. Right. It's that line, curiosity and, well, maybe stupidity. Sometimes hard to tell where one ends and the other begins. No kidding. And honestly, after this deep dive, part of me is like, yeah, let's book a trip. But the other part... Is hearing those footsteps just at the edge of the trees. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think the podcast did its job. We're hooked. Right. It's not about the answers, is it? It's about those questions that linger long after the episode ends. So to everyone listening, maybe you are planning a trip to cold Hollywoods, maybe not. But the next time you hear a good spooky story, a local legend, don't just dismiss it. Lean in. Ask yourself, why am I drawn to this? What is it about the unknown that calls to me? And maybe, just maybe, in those shadows, you'll discover something new. Harrow's Creek, Maine. And and this isn't just like some spooky campfire story, yeah, right? Sure. This is a whole village found totally empty, frozen in time, almost like someone just hit a pause button on everyday life. <sighs> like, picture this. You're walking down a street. Curtains are fluttering in the breeze. Dinner plates are still on tables. But there's no one around. Yeah, it's, it's those details in your sources that really get to you. Like, it wasn't just deserted. It was the fact that everything seemed so normal, but there was just no one there. It really is like everyone just stepped out for a minute, mm. you know, expecting to be right back. But they never came back. So that leads us to the big question, doesn't it? What happened in Harrow's Creek? Well, you know, was it some kind of natural disaster, some kind of mass panic that caused everyone to flee? Or or could it be something stranger? Something more unsettling. Yeah. You know, the theories range from, well, unexplained weather phenomena to some kind of mass hysteria even. There are whispers of cult activity in some of this stuff. But there's also something else here, something that runs even deeper. Long before Harrow's Creek was even established, the Algonquin tribes who lived in the area, they would talk about this malevolent entity said to haunt these very woods, the Wendigo. Okay, so we're definitely going to circle back to the whole Wendigo thing and all that implies a little bit later. But first, let's rewind a bit. Before the disappearances, before we get to the mystery, what was Harrow's Creek like? So picture this, a cluster of these really sturdy looking homes. You have a church with its steeple rising above the tree line. There's a one room schoolhouse all nestled really deep in the main wilderness. Founded in 1891, Harrow's Creek was really all about self-reliance. Farmers, lumberjacks, families who were just used to hard work and you know, the isolation that came with it. Isolated is kind of an understatement, don't you think? I mean, they were totally cut off from the rest of the world, relying solely on the creek, their namesake. Exactly. and. As idyllic as that might sound to some a simpler life, a real connection to nature, it also, you know, it made them vulnerable. Oh, absolutely. And it's almost like the village nestled so deep in the woods became, I don't know, both a refuge and a trap. Yeah. And if those trees could talk, right. Because even before the vanishings, there were stories about strange goings on, weren't there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, even the early settlers would talk about this, like unnatural mist that seemed to cling to the village, this thick fog that would roll in, almost like it was coming from deep within the forest. Creepy. Oh, and some people would whisper about like disembodied voices that you could hear on the wind, eerie whispers that would just disappear as quickly as they appeared. Okay, see, that would be enough for me to pack my bags. And then, and then there were the lights. Yeah, the lights, those keep coming up. What were those about? Okay, imagine like flickering orbs, almost like lanterns moving through the trees, appearing at the edge of the village and then just vanishing back into the woods. They were described as being faint and distant sometimes, and then other times bright enough to light up the trees in this eerie glow. Some folks would just dismiss them, right? Like it was swamp gas or fireflies, but others- Others weren't so sure. Others claimed that the lights had this strange allure, almost like they were beckoning them closer into the forest. Okay, that's giving me serious goosebumps. It's like something out of a gothic novel. Yeah. But this wasn't fiction for the people of Harrow's Creek. No, not at all. And things took a really dark turn in the winter of 1967. Right. Brutal winter. Right. Even by Maine standards, which Let's face it, those winters are no joke. No, they're not. A whole series of blizzards just slammed the whole region, <laughs> buried Harrow's Creek under feet and feet of snow. The villagers, they were used to harsh winters. They were used to being isolated for weeks at a time. But this, this was different. This is something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when the snow finally let up, when the outside world could finally get through. What did they find? They found Harrow's Creek completely deserted. It was like the entire village just vanished. Just like that. Homes were left untouched. Belongings just scattered about. Meals were left half eaten on tables. It was like a snapshot, a moment frozen in time. This 
eerie stillness. And maybe the most unsettling detail of all, the village church, its heavy wooden doors, barricaded from the inside. Okay, now that, that sends chills down my spine. Why would they do that? Why would the villagers barricade themselves inside their own church? What were they so afraid of? It's like they were trapped, seeking refuge from something. Or someone. So with the village deserted, this air of dread hanging over everything, what did investigators make of it all? Did they find anything, any clues to explain the silence? Honestly, you can almost feel the dread just reading through this material. I mean, the official reports, Sheriff O'Neill's investigation, he was the first one on the scene, and his notes, they paint a pretty disturbing picture. Disturbing how? Well, besides the abandoned village itself, he also documented something really strange. He found these strange symbols carved into the trees all around Harris Creek. Symbols? Yeah. Like a message or something. Did anyone ever figure out what they meant? No, not really. Um, to this day, those symbols are still a mystery. Some people think that maybe they're connected to, like, ancient Algonquin rituals, maybe a warning or a prayer to the spirits of the forest. Interesting. But, you know, their true meaning, just like the fate of Harrow's Creek itself, it's still a mystery. It does sound like something out of a detective novel, these mysterious symbols hinting at something darker going on. Mm -hmm. But, and I don't know if this is worse, but my notes mention something about a message, a message that was found in the Harrow's Creek schoolhouse. Yeah. What can you tell us about that? This discovery, it really shook even the most experienced investigators, you know? Put yourself in their shoes for a second. You walk into this silent schoolhouse, dust is everywhere, there's that faint light filtering in through the windows, and then you see it. Scrawled across the blackboard, in chalk, this message. The single, chilling message. It's watching us. We can't escape. Don't follow the lights. Okay, see now, that would have me running for the hills. <laughs> Knowing what we know now about those eerie lights and the legend of the Wendigo, it's hard not to read that message and feel a shiver down your spine, don't you think? For sure. I mean, those flickering orbs we talked about, the ones that seemed to draw people into the woods, to the residents of Harrow's Creek, those lights, they weren't just some weird natural thing, you know. They represented something sinister, something tied to their deepest fears. It's like those lights were a bridge between you know, our world and the supernatural, drawing people into the Wendigo's domain. Speaking of... What exactly is the Wendigo? I mean, we keep mentioning it, but let's let's dive a little deeper into the lore, the mythology surrounding this terrifying creature. What are we dealing with here? Okay, so the Wendigo, it's it's more than just a creature. It's like the spirit of the wilderness. It's really ingrained in Algonquin folklore. Okay. Imagine this towering being, skeletal, but like its flesh is rotting. And its eyes, they just burn with this insatiable hunger. But the thing is, the Wendigo doesn't just hunger for flesh. It craves human despair. Oh, okay. It feeds on fear, driving its victims mad. So it's not just about claws and teeth. It's more psychological. Like, it preys on a person's mind, their sanity, their hope. Exactly. It can mess with its victims from afar, whispering doubts, amplifying their fears, luring them deeper and deeper into the wilderness with this, this promise. Mm. Well, no one really knows what. It's this twisted kind of solace, maybe. A chance to escape their harsh reality, but at a terrible cost. That makes sense. I could see why the villagers were so terrified of those lights. If they thought that they were, like, this physical manifestation of the Wendigo's power. But is there anything, any real evidence, to suggest the Wendigo is more than just a story? Something that connects it to what happened in Harris Creek? You know, that's the question that haunted investigators for years. And then they found these documents and they changed everything. The letters of Thomas Bellamy. Ah, yes. The letters. Mm. For our listeners who might not remember, Thomas Bellamy was one of the original settlers of Harris Creek. So tell us what was so special about his letters. Well, he kept these detailed journals documenting his life in those early days of the village. And in those pages, a really creepy pattern emerges. Right from the start, Bellamy writes about these strange things happening, weird noises at night, shadows moving through the forest. He even describes the lights. He talks about how alluring they were, almost hypnotic. So he was documenting a nightmare, basically. And he experienced all those unsettling events decades before the villagers disappeared. It's almost like they were part of the identity of Harrow's Creek. Yeah, and Bellamy's journals, they reveal an even darker connection. Remember those villagers who disappeared after following the lights? Well, you're right. Bellamy documented that too. According to his journals, the small group, they were drawn in, I don't know, maybe a mix of curiosity and maybe a desperate hope for something more, something beyond their isolated lives. 
but they ventured into the woods following the lights. They were never seen again. And that's just so chilling. Yeah. It's like their disappearance was a premonition of what would happen to everyone. Makes those warnings about the lights even more significant. Did Bellamy ever write about them again? The lights? Yeah, he did. But his whole tone had changed. What started as curiosity, you know, with a little apprehension mixed in, it became pure terror. His final entry, it's really unsettling. He talks about this oppressive presence in the woods, this feeling of being watched, hunted. And then, and this is the worst part, he writes, God help us, we should never have followed the lights. Oof. That sends shivers down my spine. It's a good reminder that sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the most disturbing mysteries are the ones we can't explain. But this isn't just some story, right? Some tragedy lost to history. Harrow's Creek still draws attention, even today. It does, yeah. Even now, all these years later, people still talk about strange things happening in those woods. Hikers go missing yeah. mysteriously. And a lot of times, those disappearances, they're preceded by reports of strange lights. So the village, yeah. it's like it still has power. I think it's definitely a place where the line between reality and what we imagine, it gets really blurry. You know, Harris Creek, it's not just some physical place, right? It's about the stories we tell about it, the power those stories have, whether it's the Wendigo or, or the mystery surrounding those villagers. Harris Creek reminds us that some mysteries, they stick around, reaching out from the past. It's like a ghost story that never ends. Speaking of, my notes mentioned something about a paranormal investigation. That happened at Harris Creek back in 2015. That must have been interesting to say the least. Yeah, that caused a pretty big stir, in the paranormal community at least. This team, decked out with every ghost hunting gadget you can think of, they set up near the abandoned church. And they find anything. Oh, they did not leave empty-handed. They recorded some strange sounds, whispers, the sound of leaves rustling when there was no wind. Okay, creepy, but not exactly. And then there was the figure. The figure, okay, now I have to know. It was this. This tall, gaunt silhouette. You could barely make it out against the trees. Just a brief glimpse on camera, and then it was gone. So some people think the Wendigo. Some do. Well, where does that leave us? We've taken a deep dive into Harrow's Creek. We've explored the eyewitness accounts, the legends, the paranormal investigations. Do we have any answers? I wish I could say we did. But the truth, much like those villagers all those years ago, it remains elusive. Maybe Harrow's Creek was just a place touched by tragedy, a community undone by a series of unfortunate events. Or maybe, just maybe, something more sinister took root in those woods, something that preyed on their fears. The Wendigo. Maybe, maybe. But ultimately, Harrow's Creek reminds us that some mysteries, some mysteries are best left unsolved. A village frozen in time, a chilling mystery echoing through the ages. What will you take away from the story of Harrow's Creek? Okay. Ready to dive into another unsettling mystery. Always up for a good shiver. What's on the docket today? Well, today we're talking about the Black Gate of Hollow Mill. Ever heard of it? Rings a bell. Isn't that the abandoned town with, like, a creepy gate everyone's afraid of? That's the one. It's one of those mysteries that equal parts fascinating and terrifying. You've got a whole town, once booming, reduced to practically nothing, and at the heart of it all, this massive iron gate that seems to radiate unease. A gate, huh? You'd think it'd be an abandoned asylum or something like that. What's so scary about a gate? That's the thing. It's just a gate. But that's where the mystery gets even deeper. Why does this simple structure have such a hold on people's imaginations? We're talking about documented accounts of strange occurrences, whispers, even disappearances, all centered around this gate. Sounds like we've got quite the deep dive ahead of us. What kind of sources are we working with today? We've got a pretty good mix. Eyewitness accounts from the town's final days, some meticulously kept historical records, even a professor's journal from the 70s. The professor, huh? Adds a bit of credibility to the mix, wouldn't you say? Right. But the journal entries, let me tell you, there's something else. Almost like a slow descent into madness. Always the best kind. So where do we even begin with a mystery like this? Well, I think the best place to start is with Hollow Mill itself. Believe it or not, it wasn't always a ghost town. Really? What was it? A bustling metropolis? Not quite a metropolis, but it was a thriving industrial town back in the late 1800s. Founded in 1889, the whole town revolved around a massive iron mill. Iron mill, huh? 
Those places were known for being pretty rough. They were. And, you know, that's an interesting point to bring up because a lot of the sources point to the mill's harsh conditions as a breeding ground for the town's unease. Long hours, dangerous work, accidents. It all contributed to a sense of dread that seemed to permeate the town. Almost like a powder keg of fear and superstition just waiting for a spark. Exactly. And that spark, it seems, arrived in 1915 when Hollow Mill went completely silent. People just vanished, leaving everything behind. Homes, belongings, even food still on the tables. And that's when the whispers of the Black Gates start, right? Right. Coincidence? Maybe. But the timing is certainly suggestive, don't you think? Like, something about the town's disappearance is inherently tied to this mysterious gate. Okay, you've definitely piqued my curiosity. What exactly were these townsfolk whispering about? They were whispering about strange occurrences, flickering lights, and unexplained noises coming from the network of tunnels beneath the mill. Sounds like every haunted Mayan story ever told. It does, doesn't it? But these stories, they were more than just campfire tales. They spoke of a palpable fear emanating from the tunnels. Miners would return from their shifts, faces pale, recounting tales of cold spots, disembodied whispers. Some even claim to have seen fleeting shadows lurking at the edge of their vision. Sounds like those miners had quite the imagination. Or maybe they were just trying to scare the daylights out of each other. Perhaps. But what if they weren't? What if those whispers, those shadows, were something more? Something sinister? Because deep in those tunnels, according to multiple accounts, a group of miners stumbled upon something that would change everything. They found the Black Gate. Now, when we say gate, it's easy to picture something, well, ordinary, but this was no ordinary gate. Oh, not at all. Everything about it screamed wrong. For starters, it's sheer size. We're talking nearly 10 feet tall, crafted from a dark, almost black iron. And heavy. Don't forget heavy. Some accounts suggest it would take dozens of men to budget, even if it weren't, well, immovable. Right, because this gate, it's not just embedded in the tunnel wall. It seems to be part of the bedrock itself. As if it grew there, or the tunnel was carved around it. And the surface? Smooth, you mean. Smoother than it had any right to be. Like polished obsidian, some said. And cold. Yeah. Unnaturally so. Which makes you wonder, what were they working with back then that could achieve something like that? And those carvings. Yeah. Don't get me started on the carvings. They're a whole other layer to this mystery, aren't they? Intricate. Unsettling. Downright disturbing. No one's been able to decipher them. Not definitively. Some say they resemble ancient languages, others... something. Well, otherworldly. But the effect they had on people was undeniable. Yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. Miners described feeling watched, a prickling sensation on their skin. Some were overcome with a sudden, overwhelming sense of dread. And these were experienced miners, right? People who spent their lives in the dark, facing danger head on. If they were spooked, you know it had to be something else. Imagine, if you will, you're down in those tunnels, the air thick with coal dust, and the silence broken only by the drip, drip, drip of water. Then you turn a corner, and there it is. This impossibly smooth black iron gate covered in these bizarre carvings that seem to writhe in the dim lantern light. It's like something out of a nightmare. Precisely. And to make matters worse, the story started to get, well, a lot more concrete in the spring of 1915. A group of miners, they vanished. Disappeared without a trace. Tools left behind, like they just dropped everything and ran, or were taken. The only sign that something was amiss. Deep gouge marks on the gate itself as if whatever was on the other side was trying to force its way through. It's like something out of a horror movie. Stranger than fiction, my friend. Stranger than fiction. After that, the stories, the whispers, they took on a life of their own. Yeah. Panic ensued. People abandoned their home, their belongings. Practically overnight, Hollow Mill became a ghost town. And this is where a new chapter in our story begins, because even with the town abandoned, the Black Gate, it refused to be forgotten. Fast forward a few decades. The year is 1972. Enter David Keen. Ah, Keen, the professor who dared to venture where others feared to tread. Exactly. He's this history professor fascinated by the unexplained. And something about the Black Gate, it just drew him in. You know, it's interesting how certain stories, they just seem to dig their claws into us, don't they? They do. And Keen, he was determined to uncover the truth behind the Black Gate whatever the cost. He assembles a team, heads out to Hollow Mill, and get this, he brings along a whole bunch of equipment. Cameras, recording devices, the works. A man after my own heart. <laughs> Always document, right. Can't be too careful with these things. Right. 
But here's the thing about Keane. He wasn't just interested in capturing evidence. He was meticulous about documenting his own experiences. Every thought, every feeling, every shiver down the spine, all meticulously recorded in his journal. Smart man. Our own perceptions can be our greatest asset or our worst enemy in these situations. And boy, did those perceptions get a workout. According to his journal, just being in the abandoned mill was an experience in itself. Oppressive silence, unnatural cold, that feeling of being watched. Classic haunting tropes, but effective nonetheless. And that's before they even got to the tunnels. Right, because the main attraction was still waiting for them deep underground. The moment they reached the Black Gate, Keen wrote that the air, it just changed like a wave of something heavy washed over them. A palpable shift, as if they'd stepped across a threshold into somewhere else. And the whispers started. The whispers, do you mean? Not just the miners' tales, but actual voices. Keen and his team, they heard them, emanating from the gate. What do they sound like? That's where things get really interesting. <laughs> because Keen's descriptions, they're, well, they're unsettling to say the least. He describes them as faint at first, almost musical, alluring. Drawing them closer. And that's exactly what happened. Despite the fear, the rational part of their brains screaming at them to get out, they were drawn closer to the gate. The lure of the unknown. Yeah. Right. Hard to resist, even when you know better. So what happened next? Keen, he reaches out and touches the gate. Oh, no. Yeah. Big mistake. The ground shook, the air turned icy cold, and those alluring whispers, they became a deafening roar. His journal describes the darkness in those tunnels, not just an absence of light, but a suffocating presence. As if the darkness itself was alive. His team panicked, they tried to run, but the tunnels, they seemed to twist and turn, changing right before their eyes. Like a labyrinth designed to trap them. The next morning, they found Keen on the outskirts of town, delirious and alone. His team, they? Gone. Vanished without a trace, never heard from again. And Keen, what became of him? That's the thing. He survived the encounter, physically at least, but he was never the same. The whispers. They followed him, haunted his waking hours, his dreams, drove him to the brink of obsession. His journal became his only outlet, filled with frantic scribbles, drawings of the carvings on the gate. Trying to make sense of the senseless. His journal, it becomes this chilling testament to the power of the Black Gate. He comes to believe he unleashed something, something ancient and evil. He even warns future explorers to stay away that the Black Gate is a prison and every interaction only strengthens what lies beyond. A cautionary tale for the ages. And you know, here we are, all these years later, still talking about the Black Gate. The town remains abandoned, but the stories, the whispers, they persist. Even today, people claim to experience strange occurrences near those tunnels. A testament to the enduring power of fear, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Or perhaps a reminder that some doors are best left unopened. So what do you think? Was the Black Gate a portal to another dimension, a conduit for something ancient and evil, or just a product of our collective fear of the unknown? Whatever the truth may be, one thing's for sure. The Black Gate of Hollow Mill stands as a chilling reminder that some mysteries are best left uh -huh. unsolved.